Don't start yet, please. We're gonna all start at the same time and end it at the same time. Okay, so we've got a group, this group, this group, are you good here? Okay. Are we looking at markers? Can you see markers? Here we go. Alright, everyone's got a marker, right? Yeah. Everyone's got your group, everyone's got paper. So, I'm going to start the timer. We've got five minutes in silence. All right? Go for it. And ideally, you can all kind of work at once. So, give space to people as they come in. <laughs> Please. This is a silent mind mapping exercise. Silence. Silence. So just start drawing. Connect what you can, but everyone can work at once.
Still about 30 seconds left.
very thankful for the opportunity for y'all to be here, so thank you very much. Um, I'm very, uh, one thing that I haven't seen so far is kind of like a listing of the technical, well, of kind of like the, the, the technology requirements that you can use. If there's any way that I can be spelled out, um, you know, like a number of iPads, uh, yeah, stuff like that. But I just want to say thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Hi, right. before I hand it over to Fah, um, if you have any notices, just actually for those of you who are here for the first time today, we have uh, Jolie who's going to record this whole thing. So thank you to Jolie, thank you to the Enchant Society, and I hope that you don't have problems with being recorded. And this is the quote 
that uh, because I joined the app a few days before, and I'm here from this um, about this quote from Pianacini, and I really like this one. Um, you never get to, you never change things by finding the existing reality. To change something, build a model that makes the existing model obsolete. And this is this responds to the multi-stakeholder government system that we are building, which I will explain this more later on. And I think it's really in, important to embrace failure. Failure should be allowed and be part of our culture. We try, we may success, and we may fail. And if, if we fail, then we learn. And I'm going to share with you uh, two case, case studies that we did. And overall, I think we've done around 30, 35, 36 collaboration, collaboration workshops um, so far in the past two years. And the first case study that I'm going to share with you is the online income tax system we designed. The online income tax system takes the form of a website that allows taxpayers to pay report their income and they get tax rebate. And every month, um, participation officers, they bring topics, they feel they need to be discussed to the um, monthly meeting. Mm -hmm. And then they will do a vote on what meeting, uh, what kind of topic that we are going to uh, discuss further uh, in the following month. And this is part of the agenda setting um, stage. And this is the page of the position website. It's actually not a position that a, a positioner signs. Um, the the uh, positioner is a, a UX UI designer that uh, finds this in context uh, online text is really difficult to use. So she op uh, he opened a forum on the Fusion website and hoping to get more feedback from other um, users and then maybe he can turn those feedbacks into the proposal that he is going to uh, do on the, on the Fusion website. But before that, the PO already acts on this. So he doesn't, he, he doesn't really actually start the vision and the government already responds to that. So when the PO's um, saw this uh, forum, and then he started to raise this issue, and then also bring it onto the table, as I mentioned, and Audrey also really liked this idea to include um, this issue uh, in the voting pool. So then everyone is really looking forward to uh, tackle this issue. But before, before we tackle this issue, it, we really need to understand why people are, fit, are feeling um, this, this website so difficult to use. So we really need to identify who are involved within the whole thing, not just about the end users, but also who are the policy makers, who deliver this service, and a lot more. So these are the people that we identify before we actually started the workshop. And it's really important to have diverse groups because diversity leads to holistic view. And we don't really want to listen to the, the majority of opinions, but we look for um, diversity. So there are end users, traditionalists, designers, IT strategists, from my staff, and also a lot of civil servants from different departments. And this is a closer look at the workshop that we do um, live streaming on um, 360 camera, also a, a general camera. And so, you, so people online who cannot participate in the workshop, um, they can also have a say and understand the whole process. This is the first workshop that we conducted. And the end of this workshop is to really understand um, people's journey and what they find difficult in each stage. Because people might come 
into the workshop and started to complain a lot of different things. But it's really important to understand where the problems occur and who can actually fix it. So we did a service group print um, and a user journey to identify those things. But it is not um, complete because those people who already got the, the tax paid, they, they talk about this after their experience. But we haven't actually looked through how people, do, how people did the whole process. So we, um, we ask the POs and also those civil servants within different departments to conduct the disability testing process. I know it's intimidating, like asking civil servants to do disability testing. But it's not about like training them to be able to do a proper disability testing. It's more about empowering them to really understand um, the difficulties that happen between different users and how you mindset that to engage with those people and build the service or policy based on human needs. So then we identify um, different issues. Then we aggregate all of the information and synthesize them and bring them to the next workshop. And after a few following, um, well, this is actually, this is the first one. Um, the first workshop after the, the, the first one, so, sorry, this is the second one. And those, those people that I showed you before, the diverse stakeholders, they actually joined the workshop and co create the, the solution. So I mentioned that during the first workshop, we get people's feelings and um, the problems that they face. And also, after the usability testing, we gather more information. And then we show them, actually, one page by page, about what are the difficulties during the process. And it's not just about the text paying process online, it's also about how do they prepare to pay the tax. And also, what happens after they, they pay the tax online. So it's the whole, whole journey. We need to think about that uh, holistically. So during the, the second workshop, we understand and identify the, the problems. And then we started the very initial cooperation about just imagining what it can be like. And the second one, we because we gather like different ideas. But ideas are ideas. We need to uh, be clear if these ideas are actually correspond and can really respond to the problems that we identified. So on the second workshop, we um, facilitate all the different stakeholders to do the prototype on what they want in future um, payment, tax payment system. And the, something really interesting struck, uh, that struck me is the civil servants, they really understand how different things work. So for example, the people from the taxation uh, department, they know um, the language they use and they, because they, they make the laws and everything. So, but that's also the, the other problem that the end user finds those languages that the government uses is really difficult for them to understand. That's why the process, that's the only reason why the process is so difficult for them. So it's not just about the interface and the process, language is also very important. And we, we, if we don't include those voices from the end user, we will never know that the people from the tech patient um, department, they actually also have a role in this. So it's really important for people to understand um, their role and to identify what they can do um, in, in the different workshops. And because we have the uh, third workshop that allow people to do the prototype, then we need to have this, uh, the fourth workshop that allows people to actually uh, envision what it looks like um, in the future. So people can test it and make sure it works before we launch um, 
the website. So we include, even including more designers within the process for them to help um, illustrate the, the interface that the people like and also the process. And after that, um, we hand this over to the outsource company. They, are, they were actually in the, in the workshop, so they can um, tell participants about their difficulties during the workshop. So we don't have something that is ready for the outsource company to code, and then they realize that they can't do anything about it. So outsource company is also uh, in, being involved in the process. And then we have a new website um, in this bank this year. And we got lots of positive feedback from the users saying that it's, it's, it's easier for them and it's quicker for them to finish the text payment process. So the main, the main change of this, this service is I think cultural change comes to the first. Because the civil servants that we work with, they understand the user more and they know how they can provide the public service space better during this process. So they include more of this kind of thinking and what they learn during the workshops and then turn that into the RFP, the request for proposal for the next year. So they include more of this kind of thinking. And also the the digital, the, the digital uh, online text paying system. Uh, the process is clear, it's step by step, and people will be able to see the real time calculation. So by the time that they're filling their information, they know why they're paying this much tax during the process. Also, there is a guide before they do the, uh, they, they started paying tax online. Because they have four different portals for them to, to be able to get into the system. And sometimes they don't know what they have to prepare. Do they need to have a card reader? What card do they have to have? The health card or some other uh, information that they have to be, that they have to have ready at hand. So we also tell them that these are the things that you have to prepare before you start. And then, so they don't have to go back to the start to find their card. So um, I think the whole process broadened the horizon of civic participation and opportunities for collaboration across the government. And Peel Network and Small Stakeholder Collaboration Workshop created alternatives for civic participation and opportunities for collaboration across the government. People have another option to have a say apart from voting, protesting on the streets, creating active discussion on the internet, which is a very common social phenomenon in Taiwan. And the case study, the second case study that I'm going to share with you is the wildlife conservation in Kung Fu. And the PO of this topic is actually here, um, Patricia. Yeah, so she will actually share with you some of her uh, experience, that her my perspective. So the Pong Fu is, is an island just um, nearby the, the, the southeast of Taiwan. And I can show you the, the area. So Taiwan is up over there and this is Pong Fu. And there are a few islands around that area. And there is a particular um, sea area that people were talking about. Um, should they, should they um, stop the fishermen's fishing behavior around that area? And it's a, con it's a contradiction between so many different industries. Between fisher, uh, fisher industry, fisher industry, environmental production groups and the tourist industry. So we also include um, different stakeholders in the workshop. It's even more than the one that I showed you before because there are three different industries involved and the civil servants from 
console for the culture based on interior and actually more than that. Coast Guard Administration, Ministry of Fi Transport, Ministry of Finance. And also we include lots of uh, uh, we, lots of uh, chief of villages, uh, petitioners and local authorities. And there are also fishermen's association, environmental protection groups, tourism industry groups, and also also us. And because it's a, a very uh, remote area, uh, a suburban area. So not everyone is actually able to use Slido. We we put Slido in our meetings just to let people to have better chance to to have a say. So we also uh, provide them some notes that they can write on and pass on to the specific which I will show you later. And what I want to uh, address more on this case study is um, about listening to the people. We uh, had a trip before the workshop to actually get in touch to those stakeholders. Um, we were on this boat. I don't know if the photo people show, but it's like a very dramatic trip. It, the ship goes down, or up and down, up and down. And and we were actually still interviewing people uh, when we were on the boat. So we interviewed um, the, the chief of the villages and we observed the, the areas and also talked to more of the uh, chief of villages. And then just one day before the workshop, we tried to gather as many as feedback and their views from different stakeholders like I showed earlier. And more discussing with different um, with POs and other civil servants from the history of the interior. And the, the interesting thing of this topic is they're they're protesters outside the, the workshop. So we decided to have two uh, rooms for for the workshop. One, the first one is the, the big room that people are able to see the live streaming from the second the second room. And those people are the MPs and um, politicians and protesters like those people who really want to have a say. Um, they will they will come to this room, and Audrey is a compliment in the first room. And the second room uh, includes the peoples from also from diverse diverse um, groups. So those people who are um, those groups in the first room, they have representatives in the second room as well. So we are not using our uh, people's voice, but it's just so difficult if we are going to have a work like a meeting that includes 100 or 200 people. It's not going to happen. Like it's really difficult to um, have the outcome that is that is solid enough for us to take with it. And the digital tool that we use usually um, during the collaboration workshop is the real time board, which you will get a chance to. Um, have a look and work on that later. We use a real time board to do mind mapping, like what you did earlier, but we did it in a more structured way that allows us to capture different people's statements and synthesize them and organize them in a sensible order. So it makes sure it makes sure that we don't um, neglect anyone's voice, but we also get a chance to reflect on those statements in a more structured way, which you will get a chance to um, work on that better on the data integration uh, topic. So this is how the mind mapping will look like. Um, this is the sheet that they were able to uh, make the statements and hand over to the presentations. So both analog and digital version of of patterns. And it's very important for us to, to document everything, just like how how it was and how it is on um, the Taiwan integration process. And this is what they came out 
the idea, the ideas after they identify the problems before. So the workshop process includes um, identifying problems, synthesize information, and also define the problems. And then later on, they will have to come up with uh, feasible solutions. And after that workshop, it's really important to be able to capture all of the feedback and all of the ideas and then turn it to the next phase, which is the policy process. So one of our colleagues helped to turn all of the ideas from the workshop in a more structured way into a format those, that those policymakers can understand. So they can deliver that later on. And also we have a half folder that have all of the process and during, before, during, and after the workshop. So people can build their knowledge on that and also avoid talking about the same issue, having the same discussion again. They can actually build something upon that. So there's a question? Yeah. So if you could just please um, take your mic. You have to switch it on. So you talked about the two, two meetings that took place. Yes, the one with the stakeholders and yeah. one with the protesters, and the protesters also had a representative and the stakeholders one. Yeah. Yes, so uh, my question is just, was all of the input also documented from both, from the meeting with the protesters as well? Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, it's, it's documented. Do you all you want to... Uh, Use the mic screen. Yeah. And then I will talk about uh, more about the participation of this resource network. Oh, sorry. I think there's one slide missing from, from, from Patricia. Do, do Patricia want to add any, anything onto that project? So, Patricia will share about this project on her view and her, her experience on working on this later on. So, why do we want to um, have the cross ministerial um, collaboration group within this, um, the government? I think there's one thing that's really important because all of the problems and the difficulties that we are facing now doesn't really have a single owner. So we cannot say, oh, drunk driving issue is need to count on the Ministry of Justice. Also, Ministry of Welfare and Ministry of Transportation are also very important because it's not just about making the law even more difficult. It's also like how can we prevent this and how can the police um, act on this better doing their day-to-day -day work. So we really cannot work alone. We have to work together. And that's why the participation of this network is so important to be able to cut from societies and create kind of bureaucracies within the government. So um, as I mentioned before in the his history of the field network, uh, we recruit some passionate civil servants and all strive them fully. So we don't force them to do anything and that allows them to be responsible for themselves and, and actually do a better job. So we also encourage those um, peers to be brave and ask for help wherever they need. So these are the, um, there are 31 ministries um, in Taiwan, and all of the ministries, they have at least one representative um, from, from their ministry. And there are around 60 POs at this moment. And those POs from this uh, participation of research network, and they need to record, uh, paraphrase, and facilitate the collaboration workshops. So they they are not also um, a network 
This is an outdoor network that allows them to, to work together across different ministries. It's also a network that allows them to serve the citizens better. And we would like to make the policy making process more open, transparent, uh, participative, accountable, and inclusive. And who, but who should be included in the multi stakeholder collaboration workshop? As I mentioned before um, during the case study, we usually identify um, different people like policymakers, service providers, end users, experts, um, different organizations that really care about this issue, and also maybe corporates that they actually have um, a role in this topic. And the more people participate in shaping the infrastructure, the, the more they would like to engage. And I would like to share with you um, about the process. The old process is, the, this is the traditional process of policy making. So politicians uh, will work with civil servants to generate the policy. And they work on the process, system, maintenance, regulation. And users usually are the people who get to know about this at the end. But it's really difficult for them to change that because um, some of the policy, some of the laws are already being passed in at Parliament and they cannot really do anything about that. And if, if we have a protest, we can just postpone it. Like also yesterday, uh, we shared about the South Florida movement and the deal between Taiwan, the trade deal between Taiwan and, the, and China. And that actually is something the same. It also being just um, people just ignore it. It's not going to be passed, but we cannot do anything about it. And we don't really come up with a solution that address the problem that we're having. Like why do we want to have the trade deal? What's the the initial intention to have that? We actually don't have an, an action to respond to the original intention. So we want to avoid that because it costs a lot to go through the process nothing really happened afterwards. So we would like to include different people's voices and views. And those users are not just any users. They are diverse stakeholders, like I mentioned before. And we aggregate their, their point of views and the problems that they're facing, their needs, and then generate service based on their needs and the problems that they're facing. And then develop the system, and do the policy check, and then work on the regulation, and maintain, and maintain that the whole the whole system. So when it goes to feedback, people will generally happy about it because all of their concerns are already being aggregated in the beginning. So in summary, um, we'd like to make gentle impact, just like the ripple bubble drift. It's, it's incremental, it's slow but incremental. And also doing more, doing is more effective than talking, so you will actually get a chance to work on the whole process later on. Multi-stakeholder government system it is a system that we're building, and it creates a chance for a civic participation. And so we don't, it's, it's an alternative responding to the traditional uh, democracy, such as voting. And we would like to embrace evidence, so you will get a chance to work a lot on the statements and how you reflect on those statements and how you organize them and turn it into something meaningful, insightful, and you can have a solution based on those insights. It's really important. So we would like to and embrace evidence a lot. And the last one is change the culture through empowerment and cooperation. So the whole process is not just the process that we want to solve the problem, but it's also a process that helps us to build up the capabilities. And we can always learn from each other. So because we will have an exercise, yeah, yes, I'll put the one question. Uh, I don't know if this was addressed yesterday, but um, 
when you have a PO from a ministry, does that mean that there's a buy-in from the CIO? Or is there ever a case where the PO wants to join the process, but the CIO has not, is not bought in? Yeah, I think older is my answer this question. Yeah, so in Taiwan, every ministry CIO is a deputy minister also. So, so it's not like their job is only CIO, but also the deputy minister. So by having PO's report to the deputy minister, uh, if the deputy minister thinks it's not a good idea to engage in one of their conversation, uh, usually they do it for political reasons, like they would give a full political context of why it's not a good idea. And, and we do see that also the PO sometimes in the long term would say that this case, although you know the petitioners really want to talk it out, it is actually the purview of, for example, another branch of government, of president, uh, and, and so on. And so our deputy minister thinks it's not the best thing to talk about right now. Uh, case in point is that there was a petition about banning the uh, flag of the PRC from display um, in Taiwan. And, and um, the PO um, may want to talk about it, but the deputy ministries of all the relevant agencies think it may not be the best uh, topic for multi stakeholder meeting. Uh, eventually, I think that's going to be put in the referendum, maybe, end of this year. <laughs> but that, that is, frankly speaking, beyond the scope of our usual cooperation. Okay, so I just gave a brief introduction of the tools and methods, and don't worry about if you don't um, be able to understand everything, because we will, I will also um, do a short introduction between different exercises. So we use design and technology to accelerate those strategies, as I mentioned before. So I will show you some of the methodologies that we use. They are not all of them, but they are however, like those uh, tools and other that I'm going to show you are the core uh, methodologies. And the tools and the methods that you will be able to see later are just like the, the top of the iceberg. And thinking and ways of working is actually the everything that uh, we, we use. We use tools and uh, we use tools to elaborate thinking. So thinking and capabilities can be transferred better. So actually, at the end of today, I would like to invite you to actually think about what tools and methods you can build in your work. It's not just about there's one set of uh, tools and methodologies that you use. You can actually turn it into um, those things that we want to demonstrate and into something that is useful for your day-to-day -day life and work. This is the double diamond program, um, that double diamond um, that, we, that we use just to, it's a framework for, for different processes. So it's an overarching process and it gives people a good idea about where they are and what they can do at different stages. So the stages that we uh, include will be discover, define, develop, and deliver. And the lines, the white lines they also up and down, like it's because it's uh, divergent and convergent, divergent and convergent. So when you do, uh, when you are at the discovery stage, you will be able to get as many information as you want, and then you take the time to synthesize the information and define the problems. And develop is like you get a chance to come up with as many uh, ideas as you can. And during the delivery stage, you have to synthesize and see what's working and what's not working. And then you deliver a solution. And it's, it's actually not a, a perfect framework like in a real in a real life, we won't have only two diamonds. We will have something like like this. So you will have to do a little bit of um, uh, discovery and maybe synthesize the information a little bit and then do more discovery and maybe have some ideation. But if you feel like the idea is not 
not really responding to the problem. So we really need to identify, interview more people, and do more research. So the process is, is iterative, and you can create your own process based on the, the framework. And this, uh, this slide gives you, this diagram gives you more information about what can be included, what can be included at different stages. So like um, this one, like making who's involved is like a state, stakeholder mapping that we can do, that we, we are also actually doing um, in a, the first exercise. And then we're not including this method over here uh, in today's workshop, but it's good for you to know that um, it's also very important to do interview and shadow people in a good way, like to understand their behavior and their difficulties. And then also, during this process, we get a chance to identify problems, and this part will be included in the exercise tree. And the exercise tree will be about um, developing ideas, and then after developing ideas, we need to get a chance to reflect on those ideas and how does these ideas respond to the problems that we identified earlier. And we're like including these three later on, but it's also good to know that uh, we need to get feedback from different stakeholders. Also, we need to refine business model, like how does this going to work? And we also need to know how we measure the impact before we deliver it. So, uh, it's, we, we can use that uh, outcome to prove the service policy later on. So during the discover and define stage, we will use the first tool called issue making instruction. And this is a tool that allows you to put different um, statements um, and even not statements, like different research pieces into this format. So you get a chance to reflect on different uh, different issues and stakeholders and what you are going to do later on. So let's take a closer look. Um, before, before we actually work on a topic, it's really important to understand what, are the, pro what the problems are and also what are the existing solutions are. So we have how, like, for example, the additional problem statement, and maybe somebody talk about the solutions here, so we have to map it in this way. And when we have more and more problem descriptions, we have to start capturing them. So it doesn't, like, we can handle those information better. But it's really important to have uncertainties here, because sometimes when we are doing deliberation or when we are doing literature reviews, there are always statements that is not, not clear for us. And during the deliberation, we sometimes have the statements that some, somebody agrees that is a problem, and somebody say, no, it's not a problem, it's a phenomenon. So there are uncertainties that we have to discuss more. And the reason why we separate those information in this way is because it allows us to be able to reflect on different statements properly. And also the, the second part is uh, identifying stakeholders. So these, these are actually connected together. If there's a problem statement that's been addressed, you have to also identify who addressed that. Is that an MP, is that an end user, is that a policy maker? And when you have more and more statements during the deliberation or the, uh, the research stage, you can identify more and more um, stakeholders. So these two are actually um, you have to um, work on these two together. So you can see if there is anyone that um, is missing during the, the process. And the last one is about um, actions. So what are the current um, plans? What are the future plans? Is there any resources that we can use? So 
we are not actually going to fill this form today, but we have a, an exercise that can take you through this process. And this is the, the form that we provide serious servants during the research phase be, before they do the workshop. So this allows them to really have a whole picture about what this issue is. So they are not going to the workshop and start listening to people in a non-structured way. We actually need to be prepared so we can act better on that. And we are not wasting people's time. Okay, so during the, that is a tool that helps people to put in their research data and being able to define the problems. But during the discovery uh, stage, there are more tools that allow people to, to identify problems and, and needs. So there are uh, three different tools that I just mentioned that correspond to the tables that I mentioned earlier. So we will work on these tools later on. And there's an the instruction of how those uh, tools that we can use later. Mm -hmm. Then in the define stage, we have a tool called uh, challenge statements. And this is a very um, important part during the process. Because when we collect all of the information, different statements, problem statements, or solution statements, we need to be able to define them. Have a, a challenge statement is the statement that allows us to aggregate what we learn during the discovery stage. And that is, the statement should be open enough for us to be able to uh, brainstorming as many ideas as we can. So the statement I will uh, mention about this later on. This is just have a look. Just let you to have a look how the tools look like. And during the development stage, um, we have also another tool called idea development stage. Uh, idea development sheet on on on, on back of the room that you will get a chance to uh, put in the problems that you identified earlier and also put in the challenge statements that you have. So it gives you um, a chance to think about possible solutions and resources you may have. And this is something really important over here. This comes, um, you can put in the information about um, recent failures, uh, risk and failures. <coughs> Sorry. Because ideas is not, all of the ideas is not perfect, and you need to be able to identify what can be the risk um, if, you, if you deliver that idea. So it, may, it gives us the world that we don't deliver something that can cause more problem. And when you, when you can get a chance to find solutions that can respond to the risk. Then maybe that idea is deliverable. And also, it's important to identify who can deliver those ideas. So who these people are, and what can be, who are the visions and reviews. So how do you measure the impact, and who can actually deliver these are also really important at the end of the idea development um, stage. So it's a really long talk today. I hope it's not too intimidating to you. Do you have any questions? Yes. Cool. Okay. Uh, hey. <laughs> Hello. Good morning. Uh, so my questions are uh, uh, not to the details, but. My my concern is how are you inviting the users? Like how long does it take? What's their time involvement? What are the incentives for them to show up? If they have work that they have to miss, do you compensate in some way? How do you make them arrive to the sessions? Like the specifics about 
the participation of the people affected by the problem. Yeah. Okay, so we usually have um, three weeks to prepare um, the workshop. Around three to four weeks, because we have to notify people beforehand. So we don't really get much time to, like it's not like two months or three months, it's just usually less than one month. And the incentives for those people, um, usually it's, it's based on their interest. So um, many of those people who sign a petition, but not just them, it's also important to include experts, um, like those people who really know the nuance between different issues um, within the topic. So we want to create a group dynamic that is really diverse. So during the research stage, like I mentioned before, the, the stakeholder mapping exercise, we usually do the exercise uh, during the pre-meetings with um, within the government across different ministries. So we all tend to give us the, the list that they may think who will be capable of doing the discussion or who should be involved during the pre-meetings. And then we go through the list and curate the, the best groups for, for the different topics. And then you adapt, like for example, in the future, when you went to the village because do you adapt how you reach to them depending on who they are? So the, the people from the agriculture that actually have those connections. Yeah. So do you, uh, do you think I want to talk a little bit more about that? Like how 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 does the list being generated and how do you connect that with them? Okay. Hi, I'm Patricia. Uh, in this purple case, uh, we we just said that uh, our council of agriculture we are always keep a good connection with fishermen and the fishermen's association in daily life. So when this uh, when this uh, issue comes out and uh, and we inform them and invite them to uh, attend uh, the meeting. And uh, they shows highly concerned and uh, with a uh, highly will to attend this meeting. So let's uh, to contact the people is not a question to us. Okay. And as far as I know, the incentives, as I mentioned, is sometimes it's based on their interest. So, um, we don't really pay those people most of the times. It's based on like they would really want to have a say and they want to make a change. So that's their incentive. But I'm not sure like this because some of the ministries they actually pay those participants with their own budget. I, I have something to add. Yeah. I just mentioned uh, I just think uh, about that. Because it's a little bit of paradox in this case because uh, um, when this proposal was established, um, some people to encourage the fishermen's community to treat the uh, men who made this proposal as a, a kind of enemy, I think. So they maybe have some negative emotion on this issue and uh, the people they think if we uh, if we don't show up and uh, maybe it will harm our interests so that can uh, merge the people to come up okay yes sorry yes um, this is remarkable um i how how are the CIOs empowered um, to, like, the, the POs? How, would that, how did you break through the barrier of getting the CIOs to accept that the POs exist within their offices? <laughs> um, very careful. <laughs> so, um, so it's true that this is 
somewhat um, experimental, right? This is basically a way so that the CIOs actually do to work outside their comfort zone. Um, but on the other hand, um, it also gives CIOs much more legitimacy if they figure out who is the actual agency in charge of this policy issue. Because if you compare the uh, status before we had the PLLIC, we still have the petition platform, but it is a common observation that if the petition pertains only to one agency, it usually gives a good um, solution or at least a dialogue of the group of the problem. But if it is a cross agency, not necessarily cross ministry, if it is a cross agency problem, all the petitioner gets is an explanation rather than a real dialogue or a solution. And this is a well observed fact of the joint platform um, before the PO network has formed. So it's identified as a weakness of the platform uh, by Aqua Media, and also it makes the CIOs look actually bad if all they can do is to explain the problem instead of solving that. So it's also a way for them to, to politically leverage other ministries who should actually support um, the, the same kind of um, uh, political agenda that they're pushing, but uh, wasn't possible because of the silos. So that's the political motivation uh, for the CIOs for the PO network to exist. For the PO's themselves, of course, uh, it reduces risk. That's the, the easiest uh, uh, explanation of why PO's uh, throw their time into uh, doing this. But also for the agency people, it also reduces the cost of them explaining the same thing over and again without getting a clear uh, direction of where to improve the status quo. And all in all, this is a design to solve the coordination problem by getting people to commit on possible solutions before actually implementing it. Um, but it is not always uh, easy, because, but as the PO network is stable, as in it's the same 60 people, right? Like it grows a little bit, it's the same 60 people over the course of one year, so just apply standard game theory, prisoners, I uh, thing, because these people are stuck like with each other, so it doesn't make sense to, to just try to shift the problem away or things like that, and it makes a lot of sense to, to share food and, and do solidarity, so that's the or origin of the design, and with this design explained very carefully to the deputy ministers, they eventually uh, see, see the light uh, uh, purely on political um, um, calculus. Follow-up question to that. How were the POs uh, selected or hired, and what um, skills or characteristics were looked for in selecting those people? And then finally, does PDIS uh, provide training for people in the PO network, and what kind of training? Right. So um, there's a national regulation, the direction for implementing the roles of participation officers in the executive unit, and so partner agencies. Uh, that uh, is a great read that I encourage you all to read it eventually as on some Google Docs um, that, that I just pasted in. But in short summary, yes, we do provide training, but most training is through problem based learning. That is a collaboration between the communities itself. And the POs um, that doesn't get petitions or uh, other collaborations, like the, um, I don't know, National Palace Museum, um, which is part of the cabinet. Um, and, and things like that, and the Hakka um, Council and whatever, uh, they become supporting group uh, to the um, collaboration meetings by the other ministries that are more busy. Um, so that's the training part. Um, as for the picking POs part, uh, we famously posted on um, the, the national uh, bulletin board is <laughs> the civil society the P PTD, uh, which is the equivalent of Reddit. Uh, right? So we, we actually post it on the equivalent of slash r slash public service uh, and, and say, you know, who want to be a PO is just speak up, but your first has to be a public servant. Uh, and so we, we did get some POs this way, uh, but the requirement is that they are career public servants, and they are usually senior ones. Um, and um, the, C the CIOs may not know them personally, but uh, authorize them uh, to basically lead a internal uh, cross-agency team, exactly the way he is uh, well, facilitating, I wouldn't say leading, um, the, the PO network. So it's a fractal like uh, structure. And the uh, Council of Agriculture has the distinction of passing its own regulation um, on participation offices of subordinate agencies. So the 
same, exactly the same structure. It is replicated on the level in the voice level uh, agencies uh, with the same time structure and training structure. So, so this is like a fractal way of doing more holistic um, selection. And it's all vetted by the Seattle, of course, but the POs also has to um, volunteer for it, like it has to agree with it. And we try to have POs led by very long students, this are senior, uh, and they're not, and not able to go for names because otherwise they just get located at the central, uh, the, the chief information officers who are also deputy ministers. So uh, each ministry may have one or two or three deputy ministers, and one of them are bound to be the CIO. And is, does the CIO have the purview of the technology budget and kind of digital media? Within the ministry, yes. Have, sorry about this. Has uh, information that service through these PO events resulted in changes in legislation, like changes in policy at the legislative level? It, uh, it's easier, far easier to change in the regulation and policy level because that's something that administration can do by itself. Fortunately, most of the decisions are happening at this level. Uh, but if it does require a law change, uh, then we, we need to work with the legislature somehow. So just like uh, the VK1 uh, set up, uh, introduced uh, yesterday, sometimes we uh, invite, actually they invite themselves to uh, aides at the MPs and in the MP themselves watch over the live stream and so on uh, in anticipation of the administration proposing a bill draft. And that's a Taiwan's uh, constitution basically uh, allows, actually calls, for the administration to propose its own draft bill for the parliament to deliberate. Uh, and so we see ourselves as doing homework, research work <laughs> for the MPs if it does come to a law change. But we have no control over how MPs uh, interpret our suggestions, so we can prepare up to the point where we send a draft bill. But um, to be perfectly honest, uh, these um, e petitions, they are very popular as MPs' um, topics or inquiries or draft bills also. So sometimes, even before we get to the point of collaboration meeting, some MP would just harvest uh, this as their agenda. Uh, and that complicates political matters a lot. <laughs> but fortunately, the majority of uh, those e petitions for original workshop are about policy and budget and regulation. Does do legislators then actively participate in the process? Yes, but not the full process. And that's 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 all I have to say. About that. <laughs> uh, what what level of awareness would you say the civil service community in general has of the program? Like would you say? 10% of civil servants who kind of are in this milieu are, are aware of it, is it 80%? Like what? Well, of the 23 million people in Taiwan, around 5 million uh, has used the platform. So, okay. I'm sorry, about the civil service. Yeah, like, yeah. But the civil service, I'm sure that because there's quite a few very high profile uh, petitions concerning the welfare of public service. So I don't have hard numbers, but I think over half uh, of the public service are at least aware of, of this platform and, and the related uh, PMLIC. Uh, and uh, but I don't have the, the numbers maybe any success. Yeah. Um, thank you for sharing all of this. The, um, the PO network is such an unusual and progressive approach to governance. It's like both inspiring and really depressing, I think, as an American. <laughs> um, my question is, uh, comes from ignorance of, of sort of Taiwanese social dynamics. Um, who, what are the marginalized or historically disenfranchised groups and how do you reach them? And in, in the context of that, how do you define diversity? You mentioned many times diversity as a goal for, for the collaborative groups. So I think Kodri can answer the first question, and I'll take the second question. Uh, so how do we identify those um, like diverse groups? If, um, during the, so when we, when we got the, the information about what topic are we going to tackle in the following month, we will start doing research. And uh, the way that we do research is we started uh, to look at uh, what people have already been mentioned and discussed about on the e website. 
And also, we would like to ask civil servants like POs about is there any meetings that has been uh, been held to discuss about these issues and who are the stakeholders involved in the previous meetings. And also, we will look at journals and public debates and. By looking at information from different channels, we get a chance to know what the stakeholders are. And by identifying those stakeholders, we get a good look about how the group can be formed for the collaboration workshop. Does this answer your question? Um, yes. And are there, is there a major group that is historically disenfranchised in Taiwan? I apologize for such a Okay, I think only that is true. Um, well, yes, um, I think the, the Fisher, the Fisher people, they're, they're actually traditionally um, very wary of any so-called participatory <laughs> processes. Um, they're, they're far more used to like this top-down, um, like power over people uh, kind of organization. And mostly because they are in a difficult position, really, the, the near sea fishing itself is um, in danger of disappearing, as uh, far as I know, uh, especially around the Congo area. Um, in the coming decades, um, there's a problem of overfishing, there's a problem of uh, lots of things. And um, because Taiwan has such a um, atmosphere of sustainable ecological uh, development and ecological groups are far uh, more active in uh, social media and whatever other um, organizations. So, so they see themselves as somewhat as uh, in in many local issues as well as national issues. And in fact, it was framed uh, because this Kumbu case is our first uh, marine national park that's open to the public. Um, it seems as very symbolic, like um, the, the, in the interest in the name of marine um, biodiversity, we're taking a lot of so we should be the way that was the initial framing of the discussion. And so, um, but gradually they, they discovered that first, um, this is not about uh, counting the people who show up, this is not about making a decision uh, by on spot, and uh, that this is not about, um, for example, uh, their traditional way would be our argument for particular MPs or councils people to um, negate the, the whole process and stall the process. They have a lot of experience doing that. Uh, but after they uh, discovered that first technologically we make it impossible for protesting to uh, solve the actual uh, session of the second room. And the second room uh, turns out to be pretty balanced uh, to, to their interests. And that uh, there are common values like sustainable fishing and things like that that everybody nevertheless uh, agreed on. So as the collaboration in progresses, they become uh, actually much more active and constructive um, after the, the, the collaboration meeting. And sometimes they go back and watch the whole live stream and <laughs> actually discover that there are points that are actually in their favor. So um, there's no fundamental paradox that uh, or, or conflict of interest that the two or different sides does the message we uh, manage to get across, and they become much more constructive um, afterwards, uh, and uh, we uh, put a lot of their constructive inputs. Um, so while not a fairy tale, like, I wouldn't say that all fishers people <laughs> locally have been turned very importantly, the, the leader of the, the local uh, fishing uh, association actually came to a very reasonable uh, spot where we can do constructive um, things on, like um, it makes a lot of sense to first um, provide alternative routes for their careers and uh, take care of the local livelihood and empower local NGOs and co-ops to co-own uh, the development program instead of having a top-down national service park, uh, national park uh, driven program and so on. So um, those details are just um, meant to, to show that um, the layered approach actually um, gets to the solutions that works for everyone that everyone can live with. And starting from that point, um, they become become much more eager to participate in local civil organization um, after they, they see that the government is not just bowing to 5,000 people and uh, you know having their happy handed um, way on, on their living as the government actually was come to do, especially local government uh, in the past decades. So that's how we gradually work on the decent
French as it's has an issue. Um, and I think the, the nationally visible press conference uh, that Patricia held uh, is also very important in showing that this is actually, even if it's an election year, we're taking a very balanced approach in, instead of uh, succumbing to like overactive uh, interests that calls for a solution by an electorate. Um, I suppose this is the time to keep asking questions about the e-petition e platform that you use. So those of us who uh, lived through Obama's little experiment with We the People and saw how cynically uh, the White House treated those petitions and also how the press didn't take them seriously and the advocacy community barely took it seriously. I think there's a marginal conversation going on in the notes about trying to understand why Taiwan's experiment has thrived and what we didn't do here or what the conditions were that has allowed it to thrive in the way that the White House's approach was a failure. And so, can you say more about just like how it was uh, put into place? Who, you know, I mean, you could take these things and ignore them, right? Um, the threshold is very low. In the, in, the, in the White House's case, they started with a low threshold for what a meaningful petition had to be requiring a response, and then they steadily increased it. Um, they also thought, you know, well, they joked and said, well, it's all about legalizing marijuana and no one takes that seriously, right? So it's just the potheads who are most interested in getting attention to their issue. I mean, it's really, 10 years ago, that was the attitude that this is not a serious issue and they're just online, those internet people, I think Obama said at one point, you know, that's, I guess, what they're most interested in. Instead of saying, this is an issue that's being ignored, and I finally created a portal for people to get ignored issues paid attention to, and my goodness, there's actually a lot of people who care about this, and maybe we should pay attention. So I'm, I'm just wondering if you can say more about why it has worked there, what, and what we can learn maybe for the next chance we get to do this here. I, just, just before I open it, uh, I would like to add something for that. So the, the ministry that is uh, uh, conducting and responsible for the, the inclusion platform is actually over here in the National, uh, the National Development Council, um, Tiffany. So she, she is actually going to share about uh, the experience later on in the afternoon. And so she can maybe add some comments onto this as well. But the, the, the non-stakeholder collaboration model that I was talking about is not actually a uh, model that uh, directly or just to serve the petition website. Um, the models actually can be used for any kinds of topics that be raised by, by the public or by the civil servants within, within the different ministries. So I think I just want to make sure that I, I understand that. I, it, it appears to me as an outsider that what the petition platform has done is given everyone a common place to elevate things in somewhat of an equal way. I mean, as opposed to you're a celebrity, so your issue gets more attention, or you're rich, or you can raise a lot of money, so your issue gets more attention. And so from the legitimacy standpoint, um, having that sort of neutral playing field uh, is good. Um, I mean, how, how is government supposed to listen? Uh, who should it listen to? I, I mean, obviously, constituents. But the federal government, the constituency is the entire country. So uh, that's why I'm zeroing in on this. And it seems to me it, it gives a certain degree of political cover to people inside government if they actually want to do something about an issue to say, well, you see, there's a petition demanding that we pay attention to this. So there's a value in that as well. Different from saying, oh, some columnist in the newspaper is writing about it. Um, 
Okay, I'm trying to understand more about the question and also about understanding what is happening in uh, the Taiwan and Gulf Zero. And it seems to me like part of the difference is that um, there is a outside of government uh, community activists taking responsibility for creating these multi-stakeholder groups and then inviting government into it. So it's not like someone saying, um, okay, so here's all this stuff, you government do something about it. It's more like taking an initiative to do something about it and, and in a way that will also assist and support the government and so then they have more buy-in. And specifically, um, what I'm hearing is that you guys are working with the uh, administrators rather than the politicians. So it's like, how can we make bureaucracy's life easier by co-creating intelligent, responsible things, um, but not asking them to do it, but, but it, inviting them to participate in something that the initiative for it is coming from the public volunteer sector. I'm not sure if I'm understanding this, but that's kind of how I'm hearing it. So um, the PL Network is a spiritual reincarnation <laughs> of the Itawa <laughs> project within the administration. So, so it is not structured entirely like we have one because the so-called IPS, they are also career public servants and they often have other jobs. Uh, it's rare that we have a PO that are so fully authorized <laughs> that she can um, essentially lead the whole PO network within one um, ministry or one council. Uh, it is true that many PO's they still double as, for example, um, media officers, or uh, they double as parliamentary officers, as the two most common ones, but also planning officers, and so on. So they're somewhat restricted in, in their role, not like a full-fledged kind of contributors who can you know, play any role whatsoever. So there's some, some institutional uh, parts uh, that people play. Uh, it's not a pure volunteer network. That means that uh, we try to recreate volunteer network dynamic. So the, the peer selection, the process selection, and so on, all, all of that was lifted uh, from that one. So that is to answer your question. And so, short question about um, the, the, the petition and why we bootstrap the peer network using the petition. So the petition platform came because of the um, National Forum on Economic Development. Uh, and 2014, and that was one of the main demands of the uh, people who show up at the National Forum. The National Forum was held because of the Occupy. Uh, some of our movement called for a National Constitutional Forum. And uh, so the Ma ying uh, administration did not actually want to do a constitutional uh, reform forum, <laughs> so they did a more administrative uh, one instead. But uh, the people really wanted a um, con constant um, way of setting the agenda of administration and the threat, the spoken threat was always that if that's not done, we're just go ahead and occupy it at the end. So there's a political will um, often just hangs around this petition <laughs> platform that, that um, basically said if you don't make it legitimate enough, um, something like occupy would happen at the end. So, so that's the kind of unspoken uh, context of how the e-petition platform was done. And finally, uh, the e-petition platform was um, developed by the uh, then freshly built uh, NDC. The NDC was a new agency formed by the combination of two very old agencies, um, the Council for Economic Planning and Development, and also um, the, the, um, uh, the Council for uh, Research Development and Evaluation. And so these two were respectively um, responsible for long-term plans and for evaluation, uh, like auditing the other ministries to make sure they follow those plans. And now once those two uh, agencies merge together, they become very powerful because they're uh, able to essentially set an agenda and make sure that other ministries are both accountable for the agenda. And so the political uh, power of the NDC has the chief agency to, to work on the joint platform and also the national open data platform uh, far exceeded what would uh, be possible if they had it uh, be done with one of the planning or the um, you know, supervising uh, agencies. So this like super uh, ministry uh, is, I think, one of the key ingredients why it becomes so effective because they can hold the ministries to account if they don't respond uh, substantially. 
Right, I think there's a Also, one thing is, in our case, we coming back to the issue, is the level that it should be done at the city level and not the, the federal level to make it more attractive. And maybe that is some part of the comparison. Um, all right, so we'll, we'll move on to the exercise part of it. The, the group that you're, you're part of for the exercise is indicated by the, the color of the, the dog you have. And if you don't have a dog, Joanna, you don't, both of you. Um, I will, I will come give you, give you the color. And there are three tables. The, the color corresponds to the color up on the board behind you. And then Tom, Patricia, Tiffany, and Shuyang will, will lead you in the exercises and then we we'll keep coming back together for your activity. Like, what are the problems 
in, in, the, in the issue of integration data? Why do we have to integrate data? What, what are the problems? And you can start making some statements. And you can, if you, sometimes when people have problem uh, statements, then they will talk about the, the solutions. So if, you, if there are any solutions that raise up to your mind, up to your mind, then you can write it down. And if there's something famous, uh, something like that have uncertainties, so you are not sure if it's tangent or is it is a problem or is it just a, a fact, then you, you put it uncertainties. But if there's any resources like laws or any NGOs or government bodies, they are all resources. You can put that. Down. It's, do you have any questions? Okay. Is this clear to everyone? No. So, who remembers, for the folks that were here yesterday, who remembers what our topic was and what we were discussing with polls? How okay. can the city government use and protect local residents? How can the city government use and protect local residents' data? Okay, so we're going to be building off of that today. So for those that weren't here yesterday, we can catch up with your group, but that's really our question. How can, actually it'd be really nice, uh, can someone do Write it back there so we can all see it. Nice with it. Okay. So based on that issue, now you're going to make these issue statements. But uh, that's actually a challenge statement because you already have a uh, like focus area. But just just forget about yesterday's topic. We focus on data integration. And is there any data privacy? Or any yeah, it can be anything. You can decide in your within your group. If you want to talk about privacy issue, then then talk about it. Because Wait, I have a question. Would you consider the privacy issue a sub issue? Um, <laughs> would, would, you, uh, would you consider the privacy issue a sub issue of the data integration issue of the larger data integration question? Because you know that when we started from data integration, people yes. started to ask, like, right. what kind of data? Ah, I see. So you're starting about privacy? Is it about sharing data between different industries? Or, okay, yeah. So we started from exactly where we started discussing that case. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.
Then it's, it's um, going to put a whole bunch of things in the middle of the channel. It's going to be a good thing. It's going to be a good thing. It's going to be a good thing.
good about that. It's the same thing that happens when government
so in that process, most people are kind of more about identifying the social behaviors here on their district for joy or passion.
have lunch, you're prepared for lunch at 12.15. So if you can use the remaining time to see where you can get the groups. And after lunch, you can pick it. Exactly. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
can do this. Okay, everyone, but one to Great, thank you so much. All right, here's what we're gonna do before we get started for lunch. I'd like each group to go around and share. Is there any group that they feel um, you already finished everything? For this, uh, for the exercise one, that you would like to share with you what you've done? Uh, sure. Uh, we went through the exercises, and I guess we can maybe, I can just explain the categories we eventually group things into. So the major categories are mistrust, um, trust of data, data-driven injustice, you know, we're in the, uh, this use of data would kind of create this, this intergovernmental barriers, collaboration between agencies in regards to using data, and an unclear public understanding of bureaucracy, so like, what policies and practices exist right now in relation to data, and an unclear public understanding of transparency, like, um, you know, what data is accessible. Uh, and we've tried, we tried to um, map some of the uh, ideas behind below them, but quickly realized that we actually had like a resource gap um, because we, didn't, we couldn't find resources that would address these issues right now. So, um, as Julia mentioned before, that we 
Actually, during the workshop, we will digitalize those comments and statements real timely, so people will be able to reflect and add their thoughts real time as well, and it's shared with the wider stakeholders. Also, the citizens who go online, they were able to see the comments uh, at a real time as well. So, the document um, can be accumulated um, over time, so if there's, there's another workshop, then they can use this as the base to start a new conversation. So, see us. Just uh, found it interesting that our group came up with some categories that were similar to that, and was just curious if that's something that you know often happens in your workshops. That I mean, not exactly the same, but that there's parallel themes that come up in, in each of the workshops. Yeah. So, so actually, as Sri mentioned before, this is the preparation stage. So we do this planning kind of before the preparation stage to show how serious they are able to. Um, aggregate the different information. So during the preparation stage, they should um, like delete those duplicated uh, comments and aggregate them all together. So at the end, all of your groups, um, we don't have this time to do this today, but um, at the end of the session, during the preparation stage, they need to be able to come up with a complete landscape of what the problems are and what the ideas are. And then they, do, they will use this information to be the input of the collaboration workshop. So they will show that this is what we research, um, we've done for the research, and if you have any comments, you can add on to that. Just, just a quick one. Um, I, I thought initially you were killing it, but I'm also seeing the different ways that you can do this, because our categories are closely correlated to your problem, to the group's problem statements. So it's, there's, because I would have thought mistrust was a category, but it's actually the problem statement for the problem issue. Yeah. So it's it's just different ways of kind of framing the, the challenges. And it's really important that people um, get a chance to um, reflect on this kind of opinion based on the structure. Uh, actually, the um, mistrust, that level of, those are the categories, actually, for us. Those are the ones that we created out of our group of so it's a problem statement. Just curious. Sorry, please come up. Uh, okay. um, actually, it should be, it should be longer, because we've got it, we struck, who, who, what is the context of we struck? It's, it's just a keyword. It's like the outcome of the problem. Yeah. So what else we trust? People have to elaborate more on that. Yeah. Okay. That's four. There, there are four or five cards under mistrust. Yeah. So that's the general yeah. Yeah. Okay. Just understand. Okay. So we're going to get ready for today's lunch. What I'm going to ask you to do is to count yourselves off one through five, and then one, two, three, four, and five. Organize yourself by your groups. All right? Let's start over here, shoot. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. You're one. One, one, two. I'm already done. Three, no. Five. One. Two. Three. Four. Five. Hope I can remember that. No. No, you're not a one. No, you're you're helping. You're a one. Three. Four. Five. 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 No, you are three. Forty-two. Uh -huh. Three? Three and four. All right. Group ones. Two, three, four, and five. <laughs> <laughs>
Thank you. 